common perception in our culture today is that there's conflict between science and the Christian faith. And many skeptics would argue that science has rendered the creation accounts in Genesis 1 untenable. And they look at these accounts with suspicion. In fact, some would even argue that the author of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 merely borrowed from ancient Near Eastern creation myths and that what we're looking at in Genesis 1 is just more of the same. But is this really the case? I'm joined by Dr. Ken Keithley, a Christian scholar and a professor of theology at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest to answer this question. Uh, Ken, uh, what is the relationship between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and the creation accounts found in the ancient Near East? Yeah, very good question. I find it amazing anytime I hear someone say uh, that the accounts of Genesis 1 and 2 have been overthrown by modern science and is in conflict with modern science. Because if you, it, when, when one reads historians of science, uh, the ones who actually, uh, this is their field of study, there is an overwhelming consensus that Genesis 1 and 2 at least provided the framework. There's some will even go farther and say Christianity and, and Genesis 1 and 2 uh, were the essential features, uh, the exclusive features. But all historians of science, by and large, will say it's because of Genesis 1 and 2. They provided the sanction and the mental frameworks, conceptual frameworks, that allowed science to develop as a, a coherent discipline. So rather than Genesis 1 and 2 being in conflict with science, actually science owes its, uh, its origins in no small part to the worldview presented in Genesis 1 and 2. And the reason for this is, is that Genesis 1 and 2 is so different from the ancient Near Eastern uh, creation myths that were of the surrounding regions, whether it was the Canaanites or the Egyptians or the Babylonians. What one finds in those accounts, uh, whenever one does, if you, if you read the accounts, it becomes very clear that Moses, the author of, of uh, Genesis, was very aware of those various creation accounts. Uh, and he does engage with them, but he's not borrowing from them. He's not plagiarizing. Uh, he is engaging in, in a polemical attack against them. And he's doing so for missionary purposes. He is, what he's doing is that he is, uh, in effect, evangelizing uh, the Hebrew children who are traveling through the wilderness with, with him. They have been uh, immersed in Egyptian culture for 400 years. Their, their ancestors came from Ur the Chaldees, the Babylonians. So you find that their thinking needs to be changed and transformed. How does Moses do this? He does this by presenting a worldview that is distinctly different from that of the Gilgamesh epic or the Enuma Elish or the Egyptian coffin text. All of those accounts have the whatever deities come about, they bubble up out of the primeval waters. So the waters create the deities rather than the other way around. And we find that in the ancient Near Eastern myths, whatever creator deity that fashions the world the, the way that he does, he has to do it so in warfare, in conflict, because he's not sovereign over all, all of creation. So what Genesis does, it presents a distinctly different theology about God. God, sovereign, self-existent, creates the world out of nothing, uh, he does so in such a way that reflects his goodness, his character, and his greatness. He creates a world that's ordered, so therefore uh, there is a rationality about it. Uh, we are created in his image, so we are able to study the world and do as Sir Isaac Newton think, says, think God's thoughts after him. So rather than the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2 being in conflict with uh, a scientific worldview, it's the other way around. Genesis 1 and 2 uh, is the nexus, it's the matrix, it's the framework for a scientific worldview. Now you could even argue that um, in contradistinction to the ancient Near Eastern creation accounts, that Genesis 1 is also establishing a, a, a system of ethics 
that yeah. uh, uh, means that human beings have inherent worth and value. It, so that's, a, that's a great point because in the Genesis account, unlike the other accounts, humanity is the capstone. We are created in his image. Uh, in the other accounts, uh, the, the humans are created for the purpose of being slaves for the gods. Uh, and we are to provide for the gods. In Genesis 1, we have where God is providing for man. He, he plants him a garden. He uh, provides him a helpmate. We have where God enters into a covenant with, with Adam. And it is a covenant of love and respect. And there is, you know, and God walks with Adam uh, in the cool of the day. So it is a diametrically different understanding of the human uh, condition and the human position than what was advocated and taught in the ancient Near Eastern creation uh, uh, myths. So therefore, there is an entirely different ethic, as you pointed out. Uh, and so therefore, there is the basis for uh, the great commandment and uh, the second one. We're to love God with all our hearts and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves because the God of the Bible is not the biggest bully in the playground and it is not merely survival of the fittest. Uh, so therefore, we have a good God who is just, he is all-powerful. Wouldn't it be terrible if God were all-powerful, but he wasn't all good? And so he's all-powerful, and he's all good, and he wants us to live in a way that glorifies these qualities uh, that he has.